Thank you, Stefano. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, uh, thank you for um, giving it over to me at a great moment where I want to jump in and share also our uh, longer term on uh, digital assets. Let me make sure that everybody can see um, yeah. my screen. And uh, uh, sorry, one second, let me get set up here. And as you were talking about um, um, how Swiss Quote, which is really one of the fintechs in Switzerland and, and globally, um, how Swiss Quote is involved in the digital asset class, we've launched together. I would say a magazine, if you want, uh, called Crypto No Nonsense. And um, I've been sharing uh, basic uh, explanatory uh, blog posts around different thematics in the space. For example, looking at which are the mineable cryptocurrencies that you can trade uh, with Swiss code or the non-mineable cryptocurrencies why it's important to think about who holds your cryptocurrencies, regulatory issues, and other uh, topics like the halving of uh, uh, Bitcoin. So why don't I tell you where I'm coming from so, so you understand my perspective and um, without uh, you know, saying also that uh, there's a disclaimer here that what I'm going to talk about today uh, are obviously my own views. And I do come from a very traditional background from um, my career on Wall Street, the first 10 years, and then moving into the hedge fund industry. And then the last uh, six, seven years, I've been deeply involved in fintech innovation, uh, covering globally as an influencer and a thought leader, the innovations in that space. And of course, that includes the digital asset space, especially out of uh, Switzerland. So I'll be talking today about Bitcoin because it is the dominant uh, cryptocurrency and I'm going to take you on a trip if you want, come on board and um, I'll show you the places that you should be looking at or paying attention to uh, when you're considering Bitcoin in your portfolio um, as an allocation. So let me start about with a focus rather on the market capitalization. And I, I like to start with this because even the people that have major objections um, for the whole cryptocurrency uh, asset class, and some say it's not even an asset class, but let's face it, in January, 2021, we are close to a 1 trillion market capitalization in all the cryptocurrency space. If you look at this graph here, it's really the history of the market capitalization. And you see that it took off after 2017, roughly. And we've had basically an uptrend. The peak for Bitcoin is um, sorry, um, is really around 753 billion. And as I said, the whole space is close to, to 1 trillion. So whether you are a, an asset manager or a financial advisor or just a plain uh, investor, you can't ignore a market that has grown uh, to $1 trillion. That's pretty close to the capitalization of some of the GAFA uh, uh, stocks, the major big tech stocks. And what's more is that most respectable institutional grade research 
these days predicts this uh, market to grow to a three trillion market capitalization by 2025. These are the fidelities of the world, ARK Invest and others. So we're talking about a tripling or quadrupling of the market capitalization as what is expected. What I want to, to put on your radar screen is that we have two public uh, um, exits, if you want, of, in the crypto space. We have the pending IPO of uh, Coinbase that's going to happen over the next uh, couple of months. And we need to watch that because it will give us another um, price discovery of how it will be priced. What kind of projection of market capitalization for the crypto space is built into the market price where Coinbase will IPO? Coinbase um, is one of the big uh, regulated crypto exchanges that has scaled. Right now, it is valued at uh, 75 billion, and we will see where uh, it trades when it IPOs. The other company that's also pure crypto and is another um, uh, pricing point uh, for information discovery is back. And maybe you haven't heard back because it's a much smaller, uh, younger fintech, but it's really a company that is um, uh, spun off from the International uh, Continental Exchange, ICE. And um, it really has an app uh, that um, has a wallet where you can have your cryptocurrencies, you can have gift cards and loyalty points, and you can have in-game assets. And here you can see uh, an excerpt from the pitch deck of BAT that is valued right now at uh, 2 billion and is going to merge with, with a SPAC and, and go public. And you see here that the projection, the total addressable market for cryptocurrencies uh, is expected to be 3 trillion by 2025. So again, we see this number, this 3 trillion market cap that um, is, is out there. So we're talking about triple or quadruple, depending if we're looking at Bitcoin or the whole uh, market capitalization. So clearly in my mind, we have a market that has the potential of uh, um, a significant, uh, significant growth. Uh, it's a global international market, and we'll be talking about where you can fit it within your portfolio allocation and within um, that uh, context. In my point of view, from my point of view rather, it really fits into your innovation allocation. So when you look at your portfolio, you have a certain percentage of equities, maybe you have fixed income, maybe you have alternative assets, and within the equity part, you probably have a significant concentration in innovation because that is the world that we live in. We have a lot of problems and we have uh, the dominant narrative that technology is going to solve these problems and innovation is where the growth is going to be. So Bitcoin at a high level fits within that framework. 
And even though there are fundamentals behind Bitcoin, for the most part, they are left for the techie people, for really the crypto natives. And there are fundamentals, and I, I can argue this against those that don't believe it. Much like you look in regular markets at macro fundamentals, you might be looking at the money velocity, you might be looking at inflation metrics, you might be looking at uh, other um, um, macroeconomic factors. Uh, the, the corresponding in this space is to look at the Bitcoin network and, for example, look at the hash rate, which is really the processing power within the network. And right now, I can tell you the hash rate is at all time highs. Uh, you can look at other uh, more simple and understandable network metrics like what are the number of transactions that are processed per day or what is the dollar amount or the amount in bitcoins or uh, some other denomination that is processed per day. You could also be looking at the software upgrades um, and, and I showed you here too. But the truth of the matter is that most investors don't follow these network fundamentals. On the contrary, what the market has been trading on, trading and investment, is basically on different narratives. Some may argue that the market has been trading on sentiment and of course technical analysis and so on, but really what it's paying attention to is these narratives. And the truth is that Bitcoin has more than one narrative um, and these narratives, their dominance changes over time. Right now, we are trading and the market is reflecting its, its behavior is around the narrative of scarcity and digital gold. And why is that? Because it is seen as an innovative way to, to deal with the global monetary dead end that, that we, we are finding my, ourselves with all this um, money printing and intervention from, from the central uh, banks, coordinated and global, if you like. But as I said, Bitcoin um, has other uh, narratives that could become uh, more dominant or could their importance could increase. For example, by its nature, and if you look at the original uh, paper from Satoshi Nakamoto, what was Bitcoin? How was it presented? It was presented as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. So a narrative that makes sense is the narrative of a uh, um, a utility, a payment network, a global settlement network. Right now, it is less dominant. The other two narratives that are also important are, one is the narrative around self-sovereignty and, and trust. You know, the Bitcoin blockchain network is definitely one that is the oldest, it is proven, it is running on autopilot, and it offers the possibility of owning the assets, your own assets, which protects you against seizure. And this is very important because we live in a world where there are many countries that are in dictatorship or 
uh, countries where uh, the, the threat of uh, currency demonetization is very high in emerging markets and there you have the narrative which is a combination of uh, self-sovereignty and, um, and scarcity uh, that is important. So clearly from these narratives we are now trading based on scarcity but keep in mind that this may change and we might have a more of a hybrid or some other one of these other narratives being more uh, dominant. And now let's look at what happened in 2020 because 2020 is going to go down in history as um, a very important year where there's been a variety of events that um, have given uh, a whole new uh, validation to a Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network. And let's start for, from the very well-known digital gold kind of validation that has come from um, a couple of publicly traded firms that are not crypto crypto native that have decided to allocate uh, a part of their treasury to Bitcoin. And here uh, MicroStrategy and Michael uh, Saylor is uh, the biggest sort of example. Uh, right now, as we speak, um, the commitment uh, uh, of MicroStrategy to Bitcoin, the allocation at the treasury level is um, roughly $1 billion worth. This is huge if you're investing in MicroStrategy stock, you're effectively um, kind of buying, a, uh, like buying an ETF on, on, um, on Bitcoin. Then we have Square, which the Square app uh, is involved in um, crypto services offering, uh, but not only, but at the treasury level, they have allocated roughly 50 million and Mode, which is a UK publicly traded company, has also publicly announced that they are putting 10% of their treasury in, um, in Bitcoin. Uh, I must say that there's you know, more companies that own uh, uh, Bitcoin at the treasury level, uh, there's about 50 billion in total, but those are more native asset management in crypto. So I don't, um, I don't include them here. The second uh, validation that happened in 2020 and is a very strong signal came from fund managers that not only allocated substantial amounts to Bitcoin publicly, for example, Mass Mutual has committed 100 million, but also have become proponents by talking uh, about it, uh, uh, putting out white papers like Paul Tudor Jones and, and Fidelity launching a business in uh, uh, the custody uh, sector at the institutional level and more. The other validation that happened also in 2020 is a regulatory uh, uh, validation in actually three ways. The first way is that in 2020, we have regulators handing out uh, licenses to crypto banks, new banks. We have two in Switzerland, Seba Bank and Signum, and we have two in the US, Kraken and Avanti Bank in Wyoming. And uh, since I finished my presentation, I uh, should have added uh, Anchorage, which is another one in the US that um, obtained a state banking chart. And the last buy-in is a corporate buying that I've already mentioned where we are seeing uh, 
exit to the public markets of Coinbase and, and back um, going, uh, being listed. And of course, uh, PayPal uh, launching crypto services at a very basic level, uh, offering the capability, I think for now only in the US to buy and sell um, Bitcoin and two or three other cryptos and planning to uh, grow this. Overall, 2020 has given an institutional uh, validation, especially to Bitcoin that cannot be uh, ignored and should not be underestimated. And the, I, I clearly see this continuing in 2021. Now, let's look at what is happening with Bitcoin within the crypto asset class. In this graph, I'm showing you the dominance, the historic dominance of Bitcoin with respect to the rest of the cryptocurrencies. And as you see here, prior to 2017, Bitcoin was above 90% of the market. Now, what happened in 2017, we had the tipping point with the IPO um, boom, if you want, where uh, suddenly uh, fundraising uh, and, and the funding early stage uh, um, projects through the ICO um, process uh, became uh, larger than, um, than early stage VC investing. Since then, you see a maturity coming to, to, to this market and uh, Bitcoin's dominance dropping. We are right now at uh, roughly 70%, which is the all-time high uh, since 2017. And you see a healthy sort of change of that between 40 and, and 70%. The other uh, a, a important aspect and statistic to look at within the cryptocurrency space is that Bitcoin still dominates roughly 90% amongst payment cryptos. And payment cryptos are, you know, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and uh, Zcash, and so on. There, Bitcoin. Uh, it holds its dominance and it is roughly 90%. What has changed significantly over the past year is that Bitcoin used to be the reserve currency within the crypto space. So investors, uh, whether it was whales or retail, that were really uh, only investing in crypto or had major allocations in crypto when they wanted to sell a part of their portfolio they sold and held bitcoin right now that does not uh, is not holding anymore bitcoin is not anymore the reserve cryptocurrency within the crypto asset class it has basically been dethroned by stable coins. Stable coins, and especially those that are pegged uh, to the US dollar, but not only, there's others pegged to um, cryptocurrencies or algorithmic, all that space has grown and it is now $30 billion, and that those stable coins are the reserve uh, currencies, cryptocurrencies within the crypto asset class. And the last important point in terms of uh, where Bitcoin is with respect to, to the rest of the, the cryptocurrencies, over the past six months, 
uh, which is the period also that, that the market capitalization of all the space has grown significantly. What has happened is Bitcoin has become less liquid than Ethereum. And when I say less liquid, I'm referring to um, the value transfer on a weekly basis within the networks. And, and this is because of the dominant narrative of scarcity that is you know, true right now in these markets. What is happening is Bitcoin is being held uh, more and um, compared to Ethereum. So we have this um, phenomenon that did not, um, uh, that was not uh, true before. And as investors, I want to share with you a source and a perspective uh, that um, is, is worthwhile watching. Uh, Bitcoin economics is a, a source that um, uh, tracks uh, the history of uh, Bitcoin prices and the different uh, predictions that are based on different models uh, and different points of view. And you can um, check out uh, these uh, models and, and predictions. What is interesting on this uh, graph and I want to highlight is that if you see there's a corridor, uh, most predictions fall into this corridor that is uh, upward trending. We have uh, little uh, few that um, are really very pessimistic, uh, doom and gloom. Um, no, of course, uh, Noriel Rubini is sitting somewhere here on the x-axis. And uh, so the question is uh, the degree of uh, bullishness. Um, and, and you can look at this graph and also see how much in the past, uh, certain entities, be it uh, the crypto gurus, uh, be it uh, big uh, managers like uh, Dan Moorhead at uh, Pantera Capital, or um, uh, personalities and uh, research people like uh, Tom uh, uh, Lee, um, big investors like Novogratz, uh, what are their views and how their predictions have become uh, uh, were realized or not. And it's a very interesting way of looking at um, these uh, uh, predictions. Right now, there are a couple of fundamental approaches using, again, as I mentioned before, all these uh, metrics and they believe that um, uh, we are on uh, overvalued territory or really at the limits of the band uh, um, and that we have run uh, too fast, but the prediction for 2021 is 100,000. JP Morgan, for example, is claiming based on uh, the scarcity narrative, a prediction of 148,000. Now, in a very classic way of looking at this asset, Bitcoin, uh, and its correlation to uh, other assets that are typically in, in most portfolios, be it uh, stocks, um, large caps, small caps, be it bonds, be it real estate, gold, as it's also um, uh, named as digital cold or emerging markets, it's interesting to see that most of these statistics uh, show low correlations. This specific one that is um, uh, uh, done over uh, 
a five-year period from 2015 to 2020. So it does include uh, quite a, a substantial period of a bear market, if you like, that happened in 2018, 19, and looking at the 30-day correlations of Bitcoin with the different uh, typical asset classes, you see that um, you know everything is below 0 0.15, uh, which is uh, um, which is very low. Again, in my uh, opinion and perspective, I like to think of uh, an allocation to Bitcoin as an allocation to um, an innovative. Uh, uh, a solution that has more than one uh, use case and and many uh, narratives uh, and therefore it uh, it has a, a place in the portfolio and more importantly for me is not only these low correlations with these asset classes but it is to point out that the fundamentals between all these traditional asset classes, stocks, bonds, you know, real estate, commodities, and so on, those fundamentals are completely and literally uncorrelated with the fundamentals behind Bitcoin. The fundamentals behind Bitcoin that I briefly outlined earlier, you know, around the hash rates and and the volume and and the and the soft forks and and many other such metrics are completely uncorrelated with the fundamentals of this asset class. So in that sense, uh, for me, there is a very um, at the protocol level, a deep uh, negative, if you want, uh, uh, correlation or zero correlation with these uh, factors. So now, if we look with a static point of view uh, at adding uh, a certain percentage of Bitcoin in a traditional portfolio, we see that we increase the risk adjusted returns. Now, let me explain to you how this is done. Assume that you're taking a traditional portfolio, 60% equities, 40% fixed income, and then you add a certain percentage of Bitcoin, and you know, let's say the 3%. Uh, you kind of reduce both your equity and, and bond part by one and a half percent. And then you rebalance every quarter to maintain that allocation. If you do that, you see in this example, which is run uh, uh, by uh, research at uh, Fidelity, you see the effect on the returns of uh, the portfolio. And I just pick if we we did that with a three percent allocation, that would offer us a three hundred and forty basis points uh, additional return. Again, provided that we are rebalancing uh, quarterly. And then, if we look at what effect that same type of allocation of three percent rebalancing every quarter what effect it has on volatility. It does increase uh, slightly volatility by uh, 149 basis points, but it seems that this increase is well worth it because if we look at the sharp ratio, um, it is uh, really increased. It goes from at 0.59 to 0.78, so it's kind of a 30 plus increase in the sharp ratio, making it well worth it. So 
uh, you know, with the static sort of exercise, you see that even during a five-year period where, again, we've had both the bear and the bull market, we have the typical volatility uh, that uh, Bitcoin has, it definitely adds uh, to the portfolio um, uh, additional uh, returns that are worthwhile, um, uh, the risk and, and, and the volatility. And within that context, I also want to share with you some research from ARK Invest, which uh, most of you may know. ARK Invest is uh, an asset manager uh, very much focused on um, investing in innovation and, um, of course, um, believes in Bitcoin, uh, was one of the first. Uh, not one of the first manager to include Bitcoin in one of its innovative um, ETFs. And what they have done is they have uh, done a simulation to construct an efficient frontier for a portfolio and um, run a simulation to see what is the optimal Bitcoin allocation. Uh, and what that simulation shows is if your efficient frontier is constructed with the goal to minimize volatility, then a two and a half roughly percent allocation of Bitcoin is the optimal one. And if you are looking to maximize the sharp ratio, um, then the optimal allocation is six and a half percent. So with that note, I want to um, close the presentation and take questions from you.